and throw throw your dump or your poke out in front of you, sweep back so your D loop is even with you, not even behind you, and just give a haul each way, right? So you can raise your arm a bit, little back haul, right? So a little, let's say think of a double haul single hand cast. You can do a back haul on the water, so you get a really tight little V loop and a little forward haul, and you fling that line 60, 70 feet. And a lot of those spots, you only need a 30, 40 foot cast because you're fishing a high bank side, right? That was Todd Scharf telling us why the single hand spade cast can be an effective tool for steelhead. This is the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. Hey, how's it going today? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. We've got some big fishing trip uh, giveaways coming up this year and beyond. If you want to uh, check these out, you can head over to wetflyswing.com slash giveaway and sign up for the next giveaway. Todd Scharf is here to break down the things you need to know about catching steelhead on the Skeena River. Todd shares some tips on getting away from the crowds, what gear you need to fish shallow or deep for fish, and why you might want to target salmon and steelhead on your next trip. Before we get started, let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. Angler's Coffee roasts a full range of coffees with one goal in mind, delivering excellent coffee to every single angler. And I'm one of those anglers who's been loving Angler's Coffee. Great tasting, robust, and good to go. They just released a new subscription program, and you can get 20% off this box and all products at anglerscoffee.com. Just use the coupon code WETFLYSWING at checkout to get 20% off of great coffee today. That's Angler's Coffee. Com. In today's world of mass-produced products, Stonefly Nets has reclaimed the tradition of handcrafted care with their custom wood landing nets. Stonefly's goal is to create a unique custom classic wood net that are second to none in quality and can be customized for that little extra touch. Please head over to wetflyswing.com stonefly to get your custom net today. That's wetflyswing.com stonefly to get started right now. So without further ado, here is Todd Scharf from UpstreamAdventures.com. How's it going, Todd? It's going pretty good, Dave. Thanks for coming on the show. Um, we, you know, all, all the guests I have on, there's a different road to get to the guests. And, and through you, it's, it's interesting because I love the Skeena and I have some connections, a, a few and things like that. But I hadn't really heard your whole story. And um, uh, OPST, the folks at OPST, uh, James and Wade and those guys uh, kind of connected us. And I'm, I'm super happy I did because I watched um, the movie you have going and uh, they did a little short. I guess it's a movie. I don't know what else we call it. It's a short little snippet. But yeah, it's really good. I think it was really well produced, and we'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, before we get there, can you just talk about how you first got into uh, fly fishing and, and the Skeena and how that brought you to the Skeena and everything? Yeah, Dave. Um, so as, as a youth, like five or seven-year-old, young little tire biter, I was uh, introduced to fly fishing from my grandfather. Uh, he was uh, a pretty much an uh, interior lake, Kamloops rainbow guy. Leighton Lake was one of the rivers he uh, lakes he fished all the time, and he was a uh, a steelheader and stuff, but I just, I really got into fly fishing basically from him. My dad was, I would say more of a saltwater guy and, uh, didn't know a lot about fly fishing. And so my grandfather took me out. We did a couple weeks camping every year up there and I kind of learned the trout thing. Um, uh, before I learned to fish rivers and stuff because just, you know, rivers were just that much more of a thing, a little more technical and you could be kind of encapsulated uh, fly fishing rainbows, um, uh, you know, in the lake, in the lake systems and stuff, which was, you know, a pretty cool way to grow up hooking, you know, seven to, you know, five to seven pound rainbows back in the day and, uh, not knowing, you know, what you're really doing, just having the rod ripped out of your hand. Right. Uh, so it's definitely interesting, interesting way to, to start your fly fishing career. Yeah. So, so that's awesome. So yeah, you're definitely, you're in the, the BC has been your, um, sounds like your life. And so what about, so you look at the Kamloops and, you know, I actually haven't even fished the Kamloops yet. I mean, I know all about it, but it's amazing. You hear a lot about it, but you've gone more into the steelhead thing. I mean, what is the big difference? Why, why, why not just stick in and be like the the, the Phil Rowley uh, master of things as, as opposed to now you're you're kind of doing well in, in the uh, steelhead game? I would just say, Dave, just once you kind of you know born and raised on the coast and having the pull 
you know, I can never be under like, like farther than a hundred kilometers away from the ocean just because all anadromous fish come from there. Right. And it just kind of pulls you to that things. And then once you have water pulling around your feet and, uh, you feel the river and you start chucking flies and you have no idea, um, what is coming in the system that day. You could fish the river five days in a row, have nothing the sixth day you, you become, you know, you find a little nugget of gold, right? So I think just the knowing factor that these fish are like hard, they're rock hard. They swim from the ocean, everything, you know, they're, everyone's on the menu to try to eat them and that. So I always joke with my buddies now about uh, like, by all means that uh, our trout fishery here is super underrated. Um, so it, it, it's a very good fishery and stuff, but I always call those fish a little bit doughy because they're kind of swimming around just eating fish, e- e- eating food, right? Where the, where the steelhead and adromous fish that are, that come out of the ocean and then swim into a river, they're always in moving water, right? So I feel like myself, I always want to see that next corner of the river. I don't like seeing everything in one shot, like in a lake, you kind of can see, you know, bays and stuff, but you see the whole lake when you get there on the rivers, you just can, you can't see around that next corner or go up around the bank and it just keeps driving you to to go farther and farther and explore, you know, around the next corner. Cause you never know. Exactly. No, it's great. And I've, I've done, I think I've done, well, I've talked a lot about the Skeena and I think I've only had one other real Skeena episode, Rob Bryce way back at the beginning. I mean, this is probably, this is now three years ago or so. Um, so we're going to dig into the Skeena. I want to talk about it, you know, for somebody maybe that's thinking about heading up there or doesn't know. I mean, I, that's the first thing, you know, when you think about it, there's a bunch of steelhead all around the Pacific rim and you've got the Skeena base. I mean, what can you describe what makes the Skeena stick out from, it seems like it sticks out from the rest of the Pacific Rim. Why is that? I would say firstly would just be um, intact watersheds, no dams. That's a huge thing, right? And then just a uniquely genetic species of fish that that call home here, right? So water's cold. Um, A lot of the smolts take, you know, two to four years to get to grow before they even get out to the salt. So um, the fish, the smolts usually go out bigger because they have to spend a little longer time. Um, pretty much no hatcheries up here. Um, and, and I think just the, just the river sheds uh, a lot of big lakes that feed um, the rivers. And so there is some nutrients that get funneled into the rivers. The, the skein is a very long system. Um, so you have a, a lot of good quality water uh, coming into the Skeena system. Um, and I think that just bodes well for growing big steelhead, right? And as they slide out into the Pacific, North Pacific here, they have grub uh, and food right away. Um, maybe a little less, uh, um, less, I would say, uh, you know, things to cause, you know, l- less issues for them. So, you know, they can kind of sneak away and, and be in a, a, a place that, um, you know, it's not inhabited by man, right? We're pretty, we're pretty tough on everything, right? Exactly. Yeah, that, that's what it is when I think of it. I just think of it's this adventure, right? I mean, it's this remote, when we were up there, we just had a crazy adventure, you know, the wildlife, you know, the wolves, the, you know, just you name it. And then you, then you add these gigantic, you know, world, chance of a world record or uh, whatever, chance of a steelhead of a lifetime pretty much. And yeah, those, those are the things that, that you guys have. And I mean, Alaska or not Alaska, but, um, you know, you've got Russia and stuff like that and some other places, but it seems like those are just a little bit further, right? It's a little bit harder of a trip to do. And the Skeena, you know, I mean, it seems like everybody can kind of do it, although um, there's some restrictions now and things like that. Um, could you take us, like, I want to just dig into a little bit. We're going to talk about, I mean, first, let me just say Northbound, this uh, short little uh, movie clip. I think, was it produced by OPST? Um, uh, so... I have a, I would just go into the background. The gentleman who, the, the young, the young lad who produced it, uh, Vuva Media, uh, Michael Menton, um, uh, I've known the young guy. He's about 27 now, but I've known him and taken him fishing since he's around 11, 12 years old. Uh, so he was just a hardcore fly fisher back in the day. And I've taken this young lad on many adventures uh, beyond his years. He has fished many spots. Um, and so he's always been into the uh, filming side of things. So he came to approach me about doing a, uh, doing a movie um, uh, and just kind of like, you know, cause he fished with me back, you know, in, you know, 10, 15, 10, 10, 12 years ago, basically uh, when I was at the lower mainland and that, and uh, kind of got his, his career going. And then he's just followed me up here and, and he fishes with me. And, and so he's got into the, uh, uh, pretty good into the filming side of things. And he's very particular on that. And he, uh, he kind of asked me if I wanted to do something. I said, yeah, that'd be cool. And he kind of asked me if I, if I would know anyone who'd sponsor it. And I said, oh, let me talk to these guys. Cause 
um, they're into, you know, this kind of stuff and I, I use their product in that. And, you know, we, we have, a, you know, I thought it'd be a good thing for OPST to get on board with it because I know the quality and I can, as a, almost like a father figure to this young lad, I can kind of, you know, I said, Hey man, this isn't up to snuff. Right. And, and, uh, and it was kind of funny, fun filming with them because he's a fishy little bugger and he really likes to fish. And for me, it was, it was switching the shoes for me actually fishing and him, doing a lot of the filming and, and producing and stuff like that. He was really chomping at the bit to get in there and um, I wouldn't let him fish. So it was pretty fun. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's cool. I, I love it. I think the, the, the video is, um, you know, obviously there's a learning curve for everything and, and the video is not easy. It's probably one of the hardest thing, you know, the, we're doing audio here. So this is, there's challenges here um, with this, but yeah, I mean, to put together a good video, a good movie, um, you know, it's, it's not easy. So, um, so yeah, I'll put a, I'll put a link out to that Northbound, which is, I, I think a very good, um, I, what it gives you is a perspective on, on what, um, you know, what you're doing and in it, it, it's short and it's great, but, um, you know, it's awesome because I'm not sure how the fishing, I know the fishing the last couple of years has not been the best, but you have this spot where you get a take and it's obvious from the video that, it seems obvious that maybe the fishing wasn't the best and, and you got this one chance and you missed it. And I'm just sitting yep. there watching and I'm just like, oh, fuck. is that going to be the only fish? Right. And, and then, and then, you know, right after that, he clips away to a couple of fish landed or whatever. And I think, you know, so that right there in the movie is powerful because it sets that if you've been ever been to steelhead in that range, you know what it feels like to have one, only one shot and, and to miss it. Uh, is that kind of, am I on the right track there or do you guys just catch oh. a ton of fish? Yeah, no, you know, I think we caught like three or four fish in the, in the, in the three or four days of filming and, uh, which is, you know, when you bring a camera out and stuff like that, then like everything is against you. And one of the days, the last day the water blew out and we, this year we've had just a ton of water this year. We've just had system after system. So just finding water and shape was super challenging and stuff like that. Even the, you know, the couple of days that we got the fish, uh, that, that we did decently there, the water was going in and out of us all day and stuff. Right. So he definitely did a very nice job of, of showing, showing the mess and, and, you know, and that's just being eager too, right? Like you don't, that's, I think that's to me, the greatest thing about steelheading is the fact that it's not, you know, you don't go out there to expect to catch something. Once you've been around the gig, you just go in there and you start knocking on doors, right? And you start just doing your stuff and taking a step and swinging the fly. And then there's a spot in every run that's the fishable run that it feels like, okay, this, you know, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen right here, right? This is where it's going to happen between here and here. Once you've kind of, you know, you've been all around en- enough, you can kind of, you know, you can kind of, you can dial runs down to here. I'm going to fish here, here, here. If you want to fish it quickly, you know, I've been guiding since 99 and you can kind of, you don't want to waste you know, your anglers, you know, your, your, your guest time by fishing from the very top to the very bottom, unless pressure, you know, pressure is, really high in a certain day and you have a piece of water and you know, like if I fish a certain piece of the water 10 times and I might get one fish there or maybe not a fish there or one grab, or if I fish another piece of water in the same run and that's the high priority, that's the spot where I'm going to get 90% of my grab. So I'm going to kind of gravitate with clients to fish those a spots, right? Unless it's really, really busy or something like that. And, and you kind of stuck with water and stuff like that. Or sometimes it's busy fish will sit in B spots and you're not going to fish you know, I'll notice when there's guys around, I'm not going to fish. I'm going to get fish out of B water and stuff a lot more than I'm going to get them out of like the prime, like the, the classic perfect looking run. Yeah. 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 No, you, you put that well. I think that is the, you know, I mean, that's a struggle in a lot of places, you know, take it to, I just had, um, uh, gosh, uh, who'd I have on, on the Midwest, uh, Greg Senyo was on and he was talking about the, the, you know, steelhead alley. You know, and, yeah. you know, a different game over there, but, you know, lots of people and pressure, but wherever you go, I mean, you could find pressure because, you know, and I, in the, in the, the movie there, you guys, you kind of showed that too, how you get out there, you get your rafts in and you try to get to spots that are hard to get to, which is another good, good tip for people that you don't have to stick low, um, you know, but I want to dig into a little bit on the rivers you fish because I'm not quite sure what you fish and you have the, um, the steelhead lodge. What, what is the, is it Skeena Steelhead Lodge? Yeah, it's legendary Skeena Steelhead Lodge, and we're we're located just uh, north of Terrace, British Columbia. Okay, so just north. So and now, is that? Um, can you d- talk about a little bit about what rivers? Because there's a bunch. You know, uh, there's the 
the you know the Maurice from the Maurice down to all these rivers. Do you have a sp- I, and I don't want to give away any secrets or anything like that. But you, could you talk a little about? And is the legendary is that kind of a play a tongue in cheek thing or what's the steal uh, the deal there? Yeah, a hundred percent it is right. So there's just uh, just more with my clients and stuff like that, right? We always there's a lot of you know joking and gagging when you have steal clients because. You know, um, I always say I, I love getting new. I'll kind of go back to your original question, but I, I kind of like getting new clients. And the, the first thing we want to do is like, hey, I want to catch a steelhead on the fly. And I'm like, OK, cool. Great. That's let's get this done. Right. And then I kind of go about like interviewing them like you're doing to me and find out what kind of experience they have. Can they cast like what 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 is their expecta- expectations? Um, and then I kind of find out sometimes some guys have greater expectations because it's like a bucket list thing, right? And get to steal it on the fly. And I kind of say to them, hey, you know what? I, I would say it's a 10-year commitment, right? If you're going to come up and, and fish, it's a, it's probably a 10-year commitment if you want to be well-rounded and stuff like that. Some guys that really take it and they, they can get they can get to the end result a lot quicker. I'm not going to say it's going to take you 10 years to catch a fish. I'm just saying that you're going to have, out of those 10 years, you're going to have three years that are really good three years that are, you know, probably really poor, right? Um, just water conditions, everything. And then a couple of mediocre years and you kind of make the best of what you bet, you know, make the best of what you can make. And there's also the guys that goes, Hey, let me know the best week. You know, I want to know. And I go, well, that doesn't usually work, right? Because, you know, things, things are late, things are early water conditions and stuff. And that's I, one of the reasons why I think kind of that 10 year commitment in that. And so, so me being located in Terrace, BC, I'm, I'm surrounded by, if you look at a map, I'm surrounded by, you know, probably 30 different steelhead rivers. Um, and I'm in the lower part of the Skeena. So I'm only about 130 kilometers, you know, like 70 miles from the ocean and that. So um, we get the full migration of all those upper river fish that go up to the Sustet, right? And go up to the Babine and those legendary upper river trips, the Kispe Ox, the Bulkley, the Maurice, all those fish go by our door, right? So that's kind of a neat thing. And then as as the as the steelhead runs start to move in, say maybe late late June the, after fresh hit, so about the second week of July, we start getting fresh fish like summer run fish coming through here. It just basically doesn't stop till pretty much November December, right? And then we go right into the springtime because the upper tribs have to get kind of I'd say I'd say uh, fertilized and and the fish make that long run way up to those upper tribs before winter get here. And as as the the winter starts to get and fall winter starts to happen the lower tribs start to get fish right because they don't have as long a run to go so they can come in later on in the year so you know all the way from november right through to springtime we still get fish hitting the lower tributaries so it's a pretty unique system for for what we have to see an intact system to see all the different runs of fish all steelhead all spawning kind of in that you know second third week of may right through to the second week of june all spawning that time winter and summer runs but having a full mix of of stock in in the whole system which is pretty cool gotcha gotcha okay and going back to that skeena steelhead lodge is that a lodge is that on uh the actual skeena river or is it on a river i'm just off the kalem river oh the kalem yeah Kuska, yeah Kuska. Yeah, what is it like the Kuska, Kuska, Kuska kalem or something like that or what, what's the uh, it's it's a the kitsum kalem. Oh, kitsum kalem yeah yeah so that's lower yeah. That's right, because you have the town, you've got Terrace, and then if you go way down, what's the next town way down river toward past that? Uh, yeah, yeah, Prince Rupert. Which yeah, is Prince right Rupert. Salt. Yeah, Prince right. Rupert. So yeah, that, I'm just trying to recollect on my last time I was there. Yeah, so Prince Rupert. And- yeah, so you have like you have Smithers, which is like 200 kilometers east of Terrace. Then you have Terrace, then you have Prince Rupert, which is 150 kilometers uh, west of uh, Terrace. So Terrace is kind of in the middle. Prince Rupert's at the end, and then then Smithers basically is on the Bulkley. That's right. That's right. So basically, yeah, yeah you're you're kind of in the middle, and you're kind of covering fish and everything, depending on the conditions of of the water. Oh, for sure. Yeah, it's nice to get super like sea liced chrome fish, right? It's just one of those things. You hook something in the Skeena in you know late July or August that could be you know that could be an upper sustet fish and. Or a, a babine fish, and it could be a Kispiox fish, and that fish could be, you know, seven, nine years old, who knows, right? And it, you know, could be well over 40 inches, and you really don't know what you're going to hook, right? So it's definitely, you know, it's, it, it definitely can be life changing when, you, uh, when you're out there swinging for something and, and something big grabs your fly. That's right. That's right. And if you think you mentioned a little bit about the timing throughout the year, so 
You know, I mean, you said obviously you don't know exactly when the river could be blown out any time of the year. But if somebody was planning a trip, is there like somebody comes to you and says, hey, when should I come up? What, what do you tell them? Do you just say, hey, come up any time between now and then or the spring or what, what do you say? Yeah, so I kind of I kind of mention it to them. I say, you know, try to get their experience, you know, level and stuff like that. So let's say they're kind of a, you know, they're not the greatest spade caster. They can cast it out there, but it doesn't look great. But you know what I mean? They've done some, they've caught some steelhead. You know, let's say they're in the Great Lakes and they've caught quite a few steelhead in the Great Lakes doing different techniques and they, they feel good, but they're not like an expert. Yeah. So, so the other thing I'm just going to ask them, like, what, what do you, what do you kind of, do you want to catch like, like Pacific salmon also mixed with the steelhead or you just want to be a steelhead game? So the spring, pretty much a steelhead game. Um, anytime after July is going to be salmon and steelhead, you know, you could hook Chinook or, or, you know, coho or, you know, the odd sockeye on the fly, uh, you know, pinks can be fish interference on your flies. You're trying to swing for steelhead. So you have the anti pink fly. We, we fish and stuff and nothing wrong with pinks, but I'm just like, when you're targeting steelhead and it's your 15th pink in a row, it's like, come on guys, like stop eating that. So you just keep, you just try to fish stuff that, you know that you know to target it's really tough to target to have fish interference sometimes right so it just depends on what they if they haven't hooked a lot of big fish swinging on a fly then i try to get them to come in august in that time so the weather's nice it's not like winter steelheading which is our spring steelheading it's not as harsh um if they hook one and they blow it up on it or they they don't land it it's not like go sit on the log and think about it for a bit because you might not get another grab this day Right. Uh, it's just, you know, sometimes it's like that. Right. So whereas there's lots of grabs and bites and pulls and a lot of guys are kind of hesitant at that until they come and like, wow, this is amazing. I caught two steelhead and I had lots of experience not blowing up on fish. Um, and so I got my you got my feet. I'm comfortable now of, you know, hooking that fish, getting it to the reel, you know, not not trout setting on that thing. Um, and, and that's kind of a good experience also. Right. And plus the weather's usually pretty nice. So it's, it's kind of nice steelheading like that summertime fish right and you just get a variety of different species of fish you might get a maurice fish that's like a little five pounder and that next fish you get is a kispy ox fish or a sustat fish that could be like a 20 pounder oh wow right so yeah exactly so it's pretty you know it's it's pretty amazing fishery at that time right so yeah um yeah so it really depends on the client and their schedule and that and, and what i'm you know i have a lot of clients that that pretty much you know they have their slot and stuff and you know there's there's only so many spots i uh, uh, you know that that you can do in the day in a, in a year right the time you can't change right and uh yeah and i have a pretty small operation you know usually four four guests a week and that with uh, me and assistant guide and stuff and that's kind of how we roll that's it that's it cool no that sounds that sounds uh, definitely good that the earlier as well you know i guess later you go the later you go towards the fall the more fish you're going to potentially get is that kind of the deal that as more fish come in and I say of a say a, you're out there in September versus fishing July well and you're not going to have as many salmon is that is that the deal yeah I would say that's true Dave it just you got to think more fish but you also got to think a bit less fish because you're not going to get the number of those upper tributary fish coming through the ski and this is the skeena so as the fall rolls around I start to fish the tributaries a little bit more because a lot of those fish come out of the skeena and go into the tributaries to, to populate the tributaries right so the thing of the skiway uh, the skeena is like the I5 yeah. highway right that's it and the it's skiway <laughs> it's just got a yeah yeah the skiway there you yeah. go it's the ski way. Yeah. We, it just goes, you know, up and down and these fish are just traveling off the skeena and then they're taking little, you know, they're going to little towns left and right. Right. And those are the river systems that, that are feeding the skeena and that. So, you know, there's a prime migration, like kind of that, you know, last week of July, a couple of weeks in August when everything's rolling through the skeena, it's pretty cool. Cause it's super magical out there. Yeah. Yeah. So, and can you kind of break it down? Well, I was going to touch first on, on the salmon versus steelhead, you know, for you, when you think of it, you know, if somebody's saying, well, I want to catch some fish. I mean, what would you say steelhead versus salmon, any salmon, Chinook, coho, whatever? Is there is there any comparison on, on what you're getting as far as the fish, the take, or, or are they similar in some ways? Yeah, I, I would say Chinook. Like, for here, we, we uh, like, Chinook fishery here is pretty unique. They, they come in early, and they kind of end around August and stuff like that. And and those, those fish can be pretty amazing. I mean, you know, I always say they're hard – you know, like here, a little different than Alaska. Our rivers are a little bit bigger, a little bit faster, um, you know, a little more big boulders. There's definitely some big rocky rivers in Alaska. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say that. But but the, the fish we get here, um, they're pretty damn big fish, right? And uh, and you got to be able to chuck a line way deep 
And uh, it's it it's a, takes a lot out of you because you're fishing <clears throat> you're fishing pretty big tips. You're not fishing type six. By all means, you can get them on a type six, and that. But you're fishing a lot of times. You're fishing like a fist line or or a commando groove, like a, a a floating intermediate. And then you're fishing like pretty good lengths of of T material, be it you know T seventeen T twenty, right? That's kind of like you're in that zone because what you want to do is get hold your fly in the zone as long as possible. And by all means, the fish aren't always on the bottom, but we're not fishing we're not fishing tidal stuff. There's some spots down uh, some rivers we fish that come out of the ocean and stuff that you can fish a lot lighter tipped and stuff. But they're smaller the smaller rivers, so the bigger the bigger the fish, the smaller the river, the deeper that guy's going to be, right? Just the way it is. They 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 want some protection, so they're not going to be in a smaller river. Like they're not going to be sitting like on the edges where a steelhead would sit a lot of times. So you got to fish a little heavier tip just to get your fly presentation down to that fish. Um, and so, you know, to me, you know, Chinook fishing and steelhead fishing, by all means, Chinook fishing, I got, I got, you know, I got something about it. It's kind of like a bug in me that something that you don't know that you might not land um, up here. You know, you hook a 60 pound plus Chinook on the fly. It's pretty amazing. And uh, you, you, it, it hooks you basically. Right. And these are chrome fish and, and, you know, all your stuff's got to be good from like, you know, like 50 pound running line to like, you know, 30 pound bimini loop leader material to one odd hooks, you know, and, and having, you know, 50 to 70 pound backing and stuff and all your, you know, everything's got to work right. And then that might not stay in the run. You might have to chase that fish, right? Because we're fishing from, from shore, not out of a boat, right? So yeah, that's super cool. But I mean, steelhead though. You know, it, we we always the guys that fish here a lot have that kind of dread. Like you hook, not dread. I would say it's spoiledness. Basically, you're yeah. hooking steelhead, and then it's like, wow, that was fun. But then you kind of crave for that first early chinook to come in. Oh, right. Because once you hook a steelhead, it's like, okay, you know, once the initial grab, which is everything, yeah. the jump, the little bit of panic, and then you know the tug, tug here, boom, land him quick, get him back in the water, have a nice day. And then you hook that thing that you just don't know what it is, yeah. and it just kind of just blows up there. on you, ticks <laughs> off, and then you're like, wow, that thing was not a 20-minute. And by the time the Chinook kind of fishery gets over, you're just craving for a steelhead to hook because you don't want to spend 20 minutes fighting right. a fish, right? There you go. <laughs> yeah, so it's a terrible thing to have, <laughs> you know, that 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 envy of hooking fish. But those two are my favorite two game species. Coho salmon that that or silvers, you want to call them, that come up the skina are amazing because they'll eat – a swung fly beautifully not a lot of stripping involved and so you're swinging the same kind of water and next thing you know like we've had a couple really good runs of coal especially the fall northerns that come in you're fishing kind of in that september time and as you're swinging through this thing hammers your fly in tight and then it just peels off and the guy's like oh my god it's a beautiful steel and i'm like ah, that's a coho and it's almost a disappointed sometimes to have like a 12 or 14 pound coho that just basically did cartwheels all over the place i'm like god I go shut shut your eyes because that's amazing fish. It ate a swung fly, right? And uh, it, and you can't really complain about it, right? So you know it, it's it is very it's very cool to fish a big river system. And I think that's what happens. You start fishing big river systems. You just you know you can get a fish you know from a twenty foot cast to a hundred and forty foot cast, right? And uh, it, that's that's the kind of cool thing about it. So it's it's a real casters river um, to fish the Skeena and stuff like that, right? So I've had newbies catch beautiful steelhead first time spay casters just flipping it out 20 feet because like fish are coming through on the inside we have a lot of seal predation so pinnipeds hunt the steelhead out in the center of the rivers and stuff so fish get pushed in right into ankle knee deep water so a lot of guys i see fishing way too deep and way too far out sometimes they're fishing water that's not traveling lanes right and you want to fish the traveling lanes for steelhead like you want to see they use uh, you know when, when the summer fish are coming up and you'll see sockeye coming through and you'll, they use the sockeye as, you know, I call it seal fodder, like cannon, cannon fodder. And you'll see like 10 sockeye swimming and then one steel had one big square tail glowing. Like I'll be standing on my jet boat. And I can see this glower coming up. And I looked at my two guys below. I'm like, gosh, you missed a beauty that just swam by. How did you miss that fish? But some of these fish don't bite because they're moving fish, right? So you got to try to find where they're going to slow down and just hold up for a little bit. And that's where you, that, those are the spots you want to fish, right? So you know, it's just, yeah, it's, it's sometimes it's, sometimes it's, it's, uh, you know, they're fit, they're, they're anadromous fish that they're on a mission to get to their end destination sometimes. Right. And that sometimes they're not going to bite. Yeah. Yeah. I know. And you mentioned the gear. I want to dig into the gear a little bit because that is interesting on the T 17, T 20, all that stuff. Um, 
I just want to highlight a couple of things there. Um, ankle deep and 20 feet and that uh, Scott McGarva way long time ago when we first had started up, he mentioned that. That was a good quote. I remember him saying that, you know, again, starting out shallow because the, you could hit him shallow. You also mentioned, I'm going to have to rewind it, but something about deeper, smaller, bigger fish. What, can you, do you remember that little section you're talking about? So, so basically the, were you saying in the smaller rivers, you're not going to get as big a fish or they're moving where, where they hold? Yeah, I'm just thinking, think of this 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 big anadromous fish coming into this smaller tributary, right? Say not the skeena, coming into a tributary that goes into the salt. Well, that tributary is a lot smaller. So that big fish coming in from the ocean, right, with no bottom, you know, nothing really there. It's going to come and find the deepest the runs deeper, kind gotcha. of possible, yeah. right? So they're going to they're gonna have to fish a bit deeper in the smaller tributary sometimes. Whereas on the skeena, you can fish. I fished a lot of times type two, type three. You know, the, the OPST riffle I fish, even for winter fish and stuff, because the fish are sitting inside edge, not hanging out in the middle. They don't want to be, you know, they don't want to get hammered by a seal. Death from below, we call it, right? So they want to sit in that spot. They're, nothing's going to get them from above. They're big enough fish. You know, birds aren't going to get them. Death from above is not going to happen. They're not trout or ospreys. And so they're going to sit in that skinny water. So I always say, guys, like I, I've many times watched guys walk in. I'm like, dude, you walked over two steelhead because I've seen them scoot out behind you. And guys are like, no, or people cast them. Like, make a short cast, just your, just your tip and just your OPST head basically out there. And they're fishing in like skinny, skinny water and the fly stops. And they're like, oh, bottom. I know that. And the fish jumps out of the water. I'm like, no, it's a fish, man. There's no rocks. I say there's no rocks and no trout in the rivers. Any, anything that stops your fly is potential steelhead. Right. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's what I kind of meant by that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, that, then that totally makes sense. Well, let's, let's dig into the gear a little bit. Cause you've mentioned, touched on this a little bit. So, and maybe we could break it out to like, you've been doing Skeena main stem versus some of the trips. So if we take it to Skeena, what is the, you know, somebody wants to grab the gear. Uh, I mean, what is the gear? I mean, you're talking about, I guess we're talking about OPST, some of the lines and stuff like that. What, what would you tell them to throw on there? Yeah. So if I'm fishing a main stem Skeena for, for steel, I'm going to be fishing a floating head. Um, you know, uh, I fish the OPST shorter heads, great learning heads and stuff, commando heads for, for clients and stuff. It's a, it's a great product. Um, I'm running their, uh, laser line for, for running line behind. So that's kind of my, my first thing. And then just a variation of different tips The kind of the, you know, pretty much the heaviest tip, depending on like where I'm fishing on the skin is going to be probably, um, their version of like a type six, which is going to be the run tip. Right. So they have like a riffle run bucket. Oh, right. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's kind of the tip. So like a, a, the, the runs like a type six, uh, tip in there. Let's, you know, 12 feet long and that's all. I'm going to fish either the riffle, which is like a two, three or the run and they're density compensated tips. Those are kind of be my, my go-to stuff for steelhead on the skin. You know, the odd spot, you might need a bucket. Um, if, if there's say there's a lot of inside salmon and stuff like that, maybe a bit later in the year and there's some older critters hanging on the inside and you want to fish, you know, out a little bit, um, and, and fish. So you might fish a bucket or something like that and get a little bit deeper and that and swing it through. But then I'm not going to have it swing all the way on the inside because you're just going to be fishing those moving fish down and across. Cause as soon as you let it swing on the inside, if there's some old, old guys hanging around old pinks or something like that, they'll grab your fly on that, on the backside dangle. Right. And a lot of times the skin is not very deep. You see, it's a big river, but it, you know, it's three to five feet deep. There's some deep holes, obviously, but the water you're fishing, you know, I, I even say last two to four feet you're fishing, right? And uh, at a nice walking pace. So a lot of that, you know, type six or 10 feet of T11, if you guys are going into a mo tip or something like that, 10 feet of T11, you know, if I had one tip to fish, it'd probably be 10 feet of T11 uh, on that system or the, or the, or the OPST run uh, uh, tip and stuff like that. That's, that's pretty much good to go. Um, you know, in, in the springtime, we do some cool stuff. Sometimes um, uh, the water, if it's really clear and things haven't bumped up and there hasn't been anybody on the water yet, um, you'll fish. I'll fish a long, I'll go to fish some longer lines, um, some pretty light, long lines and uh, fish floating, 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 uh, like long leader, like 17 foot leader, slightly weighted intruder style fly and just fish just under surface because the fish will sit in really in tight and if you know a run that has fish in there and no one's fished it and you're kind of first guys there you can kind of go through that way and have that you can see a bat come out of the water you know in 38 degree water and a fish eat your fly which is pretty unique i think in a lot of areas right so and you can't really fish them those inside fish with pretty much anything else except for that kind of system right um is fishing either intermediate tip or a floating line long leader yeah floating line so you're saying so you're actually yeah you're using a a floating line long leader like you would for just summer steelhead fishing, essentially. And 100%. Then, yeah. yeah. And then, and that's the interesting thing about the Skeena system is that, 
I mean, technically, they're not summer steelhead. They're not winter steelhead, right? They're kind of fall. Do you call them fall steelhead, or what? What do you guys call those steelhead that come in and like, yeah? Yeah. So again, that goes into the the smaller tributary thing. So I think you'd call, you know, some of the tributaries if you have steelhead in them in August, those are going to be summer steelhead, right? We don't get a lot of June, like early July fish. They are, but because the water is because they have such a long migration to go. So those early, early fish are usually upper river fish, Maurice, um, Sustet, excuse me, uh, Babine, stuff like that that goes up that river. And they might rip all the way up there because the water condition is good, nice and cold. And then they park. They might just sit there, right? And uh, and they might sit there for like a month or two in the Skeena or maybe like two, three weeks in the Skeena until the conditions are right. The tributary is not pushing super hard. And then they slide in, right? And next thing you know, you fish the river one day and, you know, kind of middle, late August, one of those upper trips, and there's nothing there. And then two days later, boom, you hook two chrome bright steelhead that just slid in out of the skein overnight, right? So there, there's summer fish, pretty much. Summer, fall, um, definitely some winter fish that come in in November. And then we have a dedicated spring run lower down that come in in like March, April. So I would honestly say we have, you know, pretty close to four runs of like any, any designation. You can find a fresh fish if you want to go by that, by just how chrome things are. You can find a fresh, fresh fish from pretty much, you know, July all the way through till, you know, uh, maybe late April. And now let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. In today's world of mass produced products, Stonefly Nets has reclaimed the tradition of handcrafted care with their custom wood landing nets. Stonefly starts the design process by selecting wood for the handle based on a number of key factors, including grain pattern and depth, but they don't stop there. This piece of art is accentuated by strips of hardwood that complement and accentuate the handcrafted handle. To be honest, I have never been a huge net guy, mainly because I didn't feel like my uh, old collapsible net was easiest to use and was not easy on the eye, if you know what I mean. The Stonefly uh, net not only looks beautiful, but has high quality netting that is easy on the fish and will last for years to come. Stonefly's goal is to create a unique custom classic wood net that's second to none and can be customized for a little extra touch. For Ethan, the founder of Stonefly Nets, fly fishing has always had a traditional feel going back to fishing the three-weight bamboo rod with his great-grandmother. When Ethan designs a custom net, it's his hope that others will create amazing lasting memories for years to come. Please head over to wetflyswing.com stonefly to get your custom net now. That's wetflyswing.com slash stonefly, S-T-O-N-E-F-L-Y, to get started right now. What's worse than a day with no bites? A day without coffee, or even worse, a day with bad coffee. Thankfully, that isn't the case for us. With more than 40 years of experience in coffee, the Angler's Coffee Team roasts a full range of coffees with one goal in mind, delivering excellent coffee to every single angler. That's why they've released a brand new coffee subscription program made just for you. Just visit anglerscoffee.com, provide your coffee preferences, your mailing address, and how much coffee you drink in a week, and they'll take care of the rest. There's no obligations or hidden fees, just great coffee delivered to your front door. And I've been using and loving Angler's Coffee, and I am a coffee fanatic and have tasted uh, bad coffee for sure. Angler's Coffee is definitely great coffee i've been enjoying it um it's as good to be honest with you it's as good as as i've had (laughs) that i can remember and that's pretty awesome saying uh since i drink a lot of coffee so uh, join me in supporting a great company who supports great coffee fly fishing and conservation as part of anglers conservation alliance anglers coffee donates a portion of every sale to help conserve and protect our wild natural habitats and fish species Right now, they're raising money for Soul River, which brings veterans and inner-city youth out into the river to teach conservation, fishing skills, and more. Right now, you can get 20% off your first subscription box or gift box. Simply use the code WETFLYSWING at checkout. Just visit anglerscoffee.com and get 20% off your first subscription or gift box using WETFLYSWING at checkout. That's anglerscoffee.com. And can you fit, I mean, obviously the snow comes in and stuff, but can you fish into the winter like january february um you can the upper tributaries and some of the the tributaries with pretty much summer run fish they're going to close either uh uh, december 31st or december 15th right so those fish are going to close so those fish over winter and stuff and you're not getting pounded on which is good but there's definitely some depending on weather 
you know, we're pretty far north. We're like 54 degrees, you know, north, right? So we're up there. Like Alaska is not too far. Um, and uh, so you could be fishing like this year. It's been pretty decent. Like we've been like, you know, I'd say 32 degrees Fahrenheit to like 28 and then up to 34. So we've kind of been getting a ton of snow in the mountains, but not a lot in town. And water's pretty free because we had such we've had such big uh, water the last eight months. Um, it's just like the water table is very high. So water is still pushing out of tributaries pretty good. So right now you could fish, but then, you know, I can look at the, the, the temps next week and it looks like we're going to be down into the, you know, 16, 18 degrees Fahrenheit. So minus eight, minus 10, and then it stops pretty quick, right? Gotcha. Stuff freezes up. Skeena yep. freezes over. Oh, wow. And, uh, oh, yeah. Skeena freezes over. Like the, the fast stuff will run through, but anything soft will be ice flows coming through because it's so long. It might be in terrace. It might be, you know, only, you know, 26, 28 degrees, but up on towards the bulk Lee, oh, or right. if you get farther up the Skeena, it's going to be, you know, like 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Gotcha. So minus 15. So that water gets super chill by time comes down. You get floaty ice chunks. It's not fun <laughs> to swing when there's ice no. coming down. It's, it's kind of a hard, weird thing. You think you get lots of grabs, right? And yeah. You really get nothing. Yeah. So That's right. that becomes challenging. Yeah. Gotcha. But the nice thing where we live, we get lots of warm ups. We get Pacific warm ups, Mike, because we're close to the coast. So it'd be super cold. Boom. You get five days of, you know, warm, wet weather. Like warm is in like 32 degrees, 34 degrees, but above zero, above freezing. And boom, things, you know, when, when water temperature goes from like 30, two degrees right or 34 degrees to 36 degrees things wake up right so so it's kind of cool so there's windows i'd say throughout the winter time that you definitely can fish and swing a fly um but i would never say i would never ever have customers come up here because just unless i got a local guy from vancouver like a really good client of mine and said hey dude it's going to be good all next week come on up let's go fish the skeena or something like that right then i could do it right but it just you couldn't you couldn't market it or or have anyone decide to come up at any type of distance Gotcha. Okay, cool. And I wanted to go back to the lines again. So you again, talking to Skeena, you've got like, you could go with a dry line, you know, for those certain special situations or what, what, what was the line you mentioned that would be more of your standard Skeena kind of for all around? Uh, so all around it's, so it depends what the guys are fishing with rods. So I like to really match rods with lines, right? So if guys are getting into it, the shorter sticks, like this 12 foot and under and stuff, then the short heads are nice to fish, especially springtime. Cause a lot of times you're not fast. You're not casting very far, very short. And then sometimes you want to just fish a lightly, you know, slightly longer stick, like a 13 footer. And in, in a 13 footer, you can run any of the long, longer skagits or standard skagit lines from any of the big brands. Um, you know what I mean? We can go that, or you can go, you can run any of the, uh, um, you know, any of that kind of like, I would call the, uh, heavy scandy lines. So you can fish, you know, type two, type three or poly leaders. That stuff works really well too. So, um, any of the rage lines, uh, from airflow or any of the longer, the longer, you know, like, as I say, like 30 foot head stuff, any of the adaptive stuff from Rio or, or from a uh, loop, any of that stuff will work really well. It just depends on what you're, what you really want to fish. Just, just think of get going from, you know, a type two, three down to like a five or six, like that kind of level and then fly and, and depending what size bug, obviously when you start fishing bigger bugs then you kind of have to up your game a bit with a little more density at the end of your uh, end of your spay line right to have it turn over nicely if you get nice finely tapered tapered lines and long scanty lines and you start trying to throw bigger bugs on there it becomes uh yeah it becomes a bit futile right what bugs um so when would you be using smaller bugs versus the bigger bigger bugs um sometimes in the springtime water's really clear so I use a lot of, you know, I, I you know, I've dyed, re a lot of guys know me as, uh, I've dyed Rhea feathers forever and stuff and supplied a lot of British Columbia <laughs> with Rhea feathers and that. And, uh, and so I've dyed my own materials for a long time and, and tied flies commercially for a long time. And so I, I projectively go like, I predictably go a lot smaller in the springtime, um, really sparse. Um, single, single tubes, reverse tie, marabou's and, and a few bit of rea in there and a bit of, I call it marine mammal, uh, which is a little bit of polar bear. And, um, uh, yeah. So as the springtime comes, the water clarity, I kind of go stuffed it. Sometimes uh, it might seem pretty big in, until you see it in the water, but it's very translucent, very sparse. Right. And then as watercolor gets a little more colored and stuff like that, when you get summer water, you can go a little bit bigger and that. Right. So, but I think it's, it's here. We have a lot of lampreys uh, in the Skeena system, also. So I think 
rather than having such a big profile, a lot of times that works. But I think like just for me coming from the lower mainland and then coming up to fishing a big river system up here that has a lot of lampreys and stuff, we tie a lot of long, long, thinner stuff too, right? Which is kind of cool, right? So it might not have quite as big a shoulder, but it's definitely, I would say, eely, squiddy looking, right? In that, right? So just lots of movement and uh, I would say lots of uh, undulation in the fly. How long How long of, is, is a long fly? Um, you know, probably like uh, three and a half, four inches yeah. in there. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, right. just so like a little, so in the water, it's really just a little thin toothpick that's wigg- yeah. wiggling around. Yeah. But with definitely with a bit of shoulder to it. Right. So you want to have that, the shoulder to create that nice little pocket behind the shoulder. So your materials kind of dance in there. Right. So that's kind of, it really makes it live and, and jiggly on, on, on the swing. Right. And you know, just some of the stuff we fish, like guys go, where do you fish? I just go look for the jiggle. Right. And that's like the riffle, right? You know what I mean? So look for the jiggle. Fish love the jiggle. They love that broken, that broken water, right? You know, wherever you see that jiggle, that's where I'm fishing and stuff like that. And with the jiggle, it's skinny, right? And the fish are usually pretty grabby, right? So, you know, you fish in jiggle water, it's skinny water. It, they're grabby. You're fishing light tips, which is super fun to fish, right? Um, the, 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 the visual, even for like winter spring fish, the visual's right there because the fi- there's no water in the fish. So, you know, you're covering the water. Because you might only be fishing six inches deep, but the water's only a foot and a half deep, right? So you're in that zone of that fish biting zone all the time. So it just makes a it makes it a nice way to fish. Yeah, cool, cool. Okay, um, I wanted to keep uh, digging into a few more of these tips, but I, we skipped by at the start a little bit on your background. We were off here. You just kind of mentioned a little bit. You've got a you know, a connection to some of the, the repping and stuff like that. I just want to touch on that because there's you know, especially like OPST we talked about. I'm not sure, and you mentioned the the um, the intruder, you know, Ed Ward obviously is one of the big guys you don't hear a lot from out there. Well, can you just take us back to, you know, your connection there, like the companies that you're working with and you, and I know George Cook is somebody you, you've known, we've had on a couple of times on the show, just, just a little bit of that background to connect you to the the history there. Yeah, sure. So, um, I just, back in the day, um, you know, I ran a four wheel drive shop, so I always played with stuff, uh, trucks and, you know, I've always had different rigs, lots of toys and stuff. And, uh, I decided to kind of get into the into the fishing industry while I was kind of working. Started guiding um, full time back in '99. Opened my business up. Um, was you know pretty much started spay casting back in you know I'd say maybe like '96 ish. Um, there was a I, I took when I started to actually learn how to fly cast decently. I, I right where I lived in East Vancouver in Vancouver, grew up there, born raised there. Um, there was a shop called Golden West Fly Shop, right, and that was Mike Maxwell and Denise Maxwell. They owned the shop and stuff, so I I would go in there and frequent there. And and I remember talking to Mike one day, and he was he was a he was an awesome dude, but definitely he had an opinion, um, you know, quite bitey and stuff to new whippersnappers and stuff. And I seen these long rods on the on this wall. I'm like, what are you? You're crazy, old man. Like, what are you thinking with those long sticks? And these were, you know, the GT Tiger Eye two-handed rod fisher blanks you know 15 feet long and he was one of the first guys i ever ever talked you know talked about fishing a two-handed rod so that's where i kind of got started um just on the fishing side of things um so i was going about fishing in that and then um one you know i was i was doing some spay casting stuff and always with shorter sticks i was fishing you know a lot of bob miser stuff and ten and a half foot um a uh, little switch rods and stuff because we had a, like in the lower mainland we had a lot of stripping a lot of not just steelhead fishing but there was a lot of sea run bull trout and stuff i fished the upper pit quite a bit and so you always be a little stripping there'd be a lot of salmon around so you always be stripping through the back side of the swing and we'd we'd fish steelhead and stuff but it was definitely if you're guiding it you had to have a secondary game right you just couldn't be like you know you can guide two weeks without hooking a steelhead sometimes it's just the way it is right and if you're fishing with a bunch of guys that are fishing gear and you're the only guy fly fishing it definitely can be very challenging in that right so um i got into the the fishing and this to so the, the rep tackle side of thing is one of my, one of my good friends, Michael Blencarn, um, a designer for Arteryx, like started Arteryx, you know, when they're building harnesses in the garage in North Vancouver. Right. So, um, yeah, so I was a designer, like not a designer, but a tester for Arteryx. And then, uh, he started building waders and started working with Sims for waders. So, um, kind of how I met George Cook and Eric Newfeld, that was just at a, at a spay clave down in, uh, in Washington state, Aaron, uh, from Carnation put on these little spay clays and stuff. And I was down there chucking, doing a little demo with, uh, with the two hander spay, uh, switch rods and stuff with some short heads I would cut up and make. 
And uh, they seen me with a Canadian flag on a set of like basically the G4Z waiter, what you see out there today right now. Um, and, and, th- and they were just kind of like, where the hell does this waiter come from? Right. So that was kind of the design of the waiters. And that's how I met George. And then, you know, a couple years later, I started repping Sims fishing products and a bunch of other fishing brands. And I've now recently moved into the hunting side of things, uh, with Sika hunting gear, um, and some brands, uh, up here in Canada, like the Western Canada rep for Sika and, and, uh, uh mystery ranch products and, uh, crispy footwear. So those are the brands I, I do now up here in Canada, but that's kind of how I know George and a bunch of the OG crew of two handed guys doing spay, spay, spay casting things down the Sandy river clave and down in carnation, Washington and stuff like that. Right. So I've been around a long time and, and, you know, swinging lots of rivers for steelhead and, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's been a, it's been an awesome journey. Right. And I kind of ended up where I am now, you know, I decided to move up to Northern British Columbia 10 years ago. And uh, just kind of, you know, just to do my thing up here, because I remember tying flies for clients and tying quite a few, like probably, you know, a couple hundred dozen a year of pretty in-depth intruder flies. You know, even Georgie buys some flies for me and stuff, which is pretty funny. And uh, he's a bit of a fly connoisseur. And uh, and then having guys all come up to northern BC to fish for a week and I'd get them for a day or two at my end of things, guide them and stuff. But it was like kind of it was kind of bummed out about because they go up there and, and this two handed thing wasn't really as popular a lot of guys gear fish there definitely was some lodges that had guys that were spay fisher but the, the the guides were more a lot of guides were boat drivers back in the day because they you know they fished everything and, and the two-handed thing they were they didn't really the technique wasn't really super good and we're i lived in vancouver we did a lot of casting and not a lot of fish catching right just it's the it's the nature of the beast and so you got to be very proficient at tying flies and and uh, casting so i would teach guys to cast and 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 fish and and tie flies and sell them bugs and then so i decided hey i gotta make the move up here so i can you know they come see me get you know everything in one kind of area and stuff because i really enjoy fishing with clients i think it's it's uh, you know i've been doing it for a long time and it's just seeing guys swing a swing a fly through a run and hook a fish is pretty amazing yeah yeah, no, that's a that, that's a good uh, good story there. Yeah, there's a lot of Arcteryx, definitely a a big brand. And then hunting, that's interesting. So you're, I mean, what type of hunting are you focused on? Uh, so I pretty much do everything. I say I live in a blessed place in northern BC. So um, I bow hunt, I rifle hunt, um, I waterfowl hunt, and that whenever time can be. I got a couple labs uh, that I've hunted with with birds for a long time. Um, but yeah, so it's just a natural progression. It's it's a good time away from from the fishing side of things and that, and it's just, again, it's any, any excuse I can do to be outdoors, jump in a jet boat. We don't have a lot of like roads here. So a lot of our hunting takes care, uh, takes place by running jet boats up remote rivers to get into areas and that, that, uh, you don't have road access to and that. So it's, it's pretty cool. You gotta be very self-sufficient. Um, you gotta be able to, you know, run boats in, in a lot of challenging conditions and stuff and be able to not, you know, expect to see people and, and rely on someone that's going to get your ass out of trouble if you, exactly. uh, <laughs> if you get into trouble, <laughs> you're on your right? Own. So you're, you're on, on your own. own. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but yeah. it's an amazing sport. Right. And I, I think, uh, it's amazing that, you know, I grew up, uh, my dad hunted and stuff. So I grew up eating, you know, wild game and, uh, I'm super glad that I was introduced at a, at a young age and have that passion to go out and, uh, grind it out and go out there and, and, uh, and, and chase, pursue animals and have the right and have the ability to do it, which is super amazing. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love it. I, I'm, I do a little bit of hunting as well. And it, yeah, definitely, obviously it's, a uh, similar people, similar people involved in both of the, both of it. Um, I, I did want to touch, you know, Ed Ward, I, I mentioned this and his name comes up occasionally. Do you have any connection to Ed over the years? I know you've been doing this a while. Have you connected with him at all? Um, just, just from seeing him here and there, but not really fished with him and that a lot of, a lot of one step away from Ed, Yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, separated by a degree or so or something like yeah. that. Right. Was so, he, hi- was yeah. he, you're, uh, he was hiding the, you knew him back when he was hiding the intruder and the, uh, you know, so nobody... oh, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of amazing. I got a pretty quick story. Um, just some pretty cool cats from, from down South. I get this, uh, you know, just this call saying, Hey Todd, do you want to go on this kind of like intercoastal, like basically from Vancouver Island up, up on this kind of big boat, you know, like a, about, about a 45, well, I think it's about an 80 footer, sorry, with two jet boats on it. And then kind of just go fish with uh, a couple of cool guys. Like, Sh- I don't know if you know, a Shannon McCormick, uh, Howard, Howard Cole, all these guys are out of Jackson, Wyoming and, and Derry. And these are three cats I knew 
and they're they're again they're they're OGs from the steelhead swing school of you know the OP and in Washington State and the Skagit and and you know it's all hidden stuff and so me and Howard are sitting on this boat tying flies and I had a bunch of Rhea with me and stuff and I'm tying these flies and he's like dude how, where did you see were you in my fly box and I'm like no it just this is something I've been tying for a little bit because it's kind of a, a it's kind of like a weird thing. Like I've never met him before within like an hour. We're tying the same stuff that he's got that I have. And we've never really crossed paths before. So I think it's more of a consciousness of how things get developed. And, you know, the intruder by all means, like kudos to, you know, to Ed and George and those guys that, that kind of started that thing, you know, they got a few years on me and stuff, but there's like, you just wanted to, you know, I was a gear fisher to start with. Like I grew up fishing, like I started fly fishing all this, but when I started fishing a river, you know, I was fishing like a center pin. It's classic BC stuff. Center, center pin, gooey bob, cork float, five split shot, right? You know, an old silex or or a pink worm, right? We used to pour pink worms because you couldn't buy pink bass worms, right? So you get the molds from Bass Pro when we have this crazy mix and, you know, probably get some toxicity from us right now to get the right amount of rubber, melt it and pour pink worms. And you would short float pink worms on a, on a cork float and it was ridiculously good. So you start thinking, okay, well, how, how come I can hook this many fish steelhead fishing you know in back in the day when i was younger like in my teens i'd go steelhead fishing and hook you know 12 to 15 fish you know you know a day on the fl- on the gear rod and like i remember my last year before i just strictly went cold turkey is i think i put maybe 250 winter fish on the beach that year which is when i look at it now it's it's like god i wouldn't even tell anybody about this and the steel gods will like spite me because of it right but the next year i think i landed i had one grab on a fly rod Right. And then I was like, what is going on? And then I was introduced, you know, my first like client kind of spay casting back in like not even client, like back, like, just a friend of mine introduced me to this gentleman um, who's again, he's a gentleman that I fished with like for 25 years, Tony Steller, a doctor, retired doctor from Laguna Beach. He was one of the first guys I seen, you know, he was a he was spry young guy at 72 back then. And he's like 95 now and still fishes, you know, three, four weeks a year. And I feel bad that he didn't couldn't come up last year due to the the pandemic we've had, but yeah, he was one of the guys first showed me like actually fishing with a two hander and stuff. And I was just, that just blew my mind. Like I, I dabbled it with a bit, but he just was really good at it. Right. And, uh, I was just like looking at that. And after that, I was like, I was, I was sold and everything, you know, that's, that's, I've been doing that since like the, you know, late mid nineties and stuff. Right. So it just, that's just the way, you know, to me, it was just the ultimate way of fishing like cold water species and having your fly in the zone and being able to chuck it with bush behind you and stuff and not having to wade up to your neck to try to get a cast with a single hander out there. Right. And again, now like the, the, people coming up today you have the you know the the commando heads for single hand rods that's amazing right to be able to spay cast with a single hand rod is like it's crazy right like that uh, if that happened years ago i might not have went to a two-hander right because you know everything's gone back again from bigger rods and stuff we fished you know 14 footers back in the day even 15 footers i think my first stick was like a 10 151 you know sage european 15 foot one fish the thompson with it and stuff like that which is amazing river to fish and then now we're back down to 11 and a half 12 footers Right. And that's, you know, we're back, you know, my, my single hand spay rod was like an old RPL 8,100. Right. And that was like the, the, the old single hand Sage Brownie. And that's, you know, that was one of the, one of the deals we fished with back in the day with a high speed, high D, you know, on the, on the Coca Hala for, for, for summer runs and stuff. Right. Yeah. I love this conversation because I mean, especially like when you talk about OPST, who we've mentioned here, you know, they're known for that with the commando and some of the short. I mean, what is the short, what is a good average if you talk? Well, first, I guess we have the single hand spay. What what would that be? And then what is the next step up above, above the single hand spay? Like what what length of the rod is the single spay? And talk a little bit about that. Okay, so single, single hand spay um, or single hand uh, rod with spay casting techniques. Um, anything in that kind of nine and a half, I put nine foot nine to 10, 10 foot, 10 and a half. Anything that feels comfortable in your hand that's not going to be too long and too aggressive to cast single hand type thing. So pretty lightweight. Um, with those lines and, you know, variable techniques of, of spay casting, you could easily fish 70, 80 feet a line with nothing at your back cast, right? Which is nothing behind you. You can fish a lot of those high bank spots where, you know, which a lot of people don't fish, right? Because even if you have a two hander, you're, you know, sometimes you'll hit the trees, but with a single hand, you can really cut, uh, cut a lot and, 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 you know, and, and, and can't your rod over a bit to get under trees and that, right. And, and throw, throw your dump or your poke out in front of you 
sweep back so your D-loop is even with you, not even behind you, and just give a haul each way, right? So you can raise your arm a bit, little back haul, right? So a little, let's say think of a double haul single hand cast. You can do a back haul on the water so you get a really tight little V-loop and a little forward haul, and you fling that line 60, 70 feet. And a lot of those spots, you only need a 30, 40 foot cast because you're fishing a high bank side, right? So any of those sticks, now there's so many good ones. And I've even gone back and looked at some of my older single hand stuff that were, you know, in the 10 foot range that were pretty soft and that, and those things are great sticks for fishing two handed, uh, uh, spay techniques with a single hand rod. Right. And then going up from there, anything 11 and a half, I'd say to 12 feet, you know, in the seven or six to eight weight, yeah, is, is kind of the newer steelhead stick now. Right. You know, and then I even, I'm, I'm even yep. testing some, you know, a little bit bigger stuff from OPST in the nine, 10 weight stuff for Chinook and stuff. And that's not much more than a 12, a 12 foot rod, 12 foot three rod. Mm-hmm. Right. So, uh, you know, it's kind of amazing to fish with such a light stick and fish really big fish, which is super cool. It goes back to the day when you're fishing single hand stuff for steelhead. Exactly. Yeah. That's interesting. So, and what, uh, I, I guess it's still more of the two handed game, but are you breaking out, um, you know, are clients breaking some of that out, the, the single hand stuff? Well, if, if we have like specific like salmon around, like say there's coho around, a big round of coho or something, some of my guys really like to fish silvers and stuff, right? Then for sure we'll fish some of the, uh, uh, you know, commando smooth lines. So you can basically cast 10 feet to 70 feet, strip right inside your rod head because you're stripping for fish. A lot of times a fish will come back and eat it on the strip. That's kind of how you fish those silvers and that. So by all means, we fish a lot of those. I always have a couple of those rigged up and that, and I like fishing dries with them too, right? Like commando smooth, fishing dry. You can fish right in tight. Um, it's, it's very nice way to fish, uh, and that, and you know, I think it's definitely, it, it pushes, um, yeah, it pushes the envelope for where you can fish a single hander, um, which is really cool. Got it. And can you break that down just so, I mean, I know we've talked about this. I just want to clarify on the the opsc stuff so commando smooth is it pretty straightforward as far as what um you know the different uh, products they have out there yeah so so commando smooth is integrated running line okay so think of a full fly line short head that's got running line attached not just a head itself right so and then your commando head is going to be just a short running line a short short head with um you attach a mono style opst running line or whoever's running line after it like the laser line behind that and then you have the newer commando groove, which is floating at the backside, and then it's a full intermediate in the front. So it's going to swing a lot slower through some of the stuff. I fished that quite a bit. Like at first, I was like, I was like, cut, cool, it's a cool line, but like I don't think it's going to be applicable for a lot of stuff. Then I started fishing when we had like a bit of high water this year, and it's a pretty amazing line because you could fish, you could just slow your swing down. You might not get that deeper because I was fishing lighter tips with it. Like I was fishing on the commando groove. So think of having, you know, 12 feet of intermediate and then whatever tip in front of that. And I was fishing like only maybe a type three in front of that. So I'm fishing, you know, intermediate, a type three of about 23 feet long. So it was, it wasn't only fishing a foot and a half deep, but it was really slowing the swing yeah, down gotcha. because it, it cut through surface. that initial, yeah, the initial surface yeah. of the water and it got into the column and it was actually very effective. Whereas I would, if I was fishing just a floating head, it would almost swing too quick. Even I started going with a heavier tip and then it would snag up on the dangle. Right. So it just, there's, there's multiple ways to skin the cat. And I think you just need all these arsenals in, in your, in your, in your pocket to, to fish variable conditions. Gotcha. Okay. And then, and then just to finish that up. So, and then the commando smooth, how is that different than the commando groove? The smooth, uh, not, not the, um, not the head, but just the commando smooth. Yeah. The smooth is going to be a full floater and the yeah. groove is going to have a floating back end with, uh, intermediate front. That's it. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. And yeah, that's if, it. And then the groove, the groove, yeah. the groove's going to be ahead also. Yeah. Yeah. And the groove's going to be ahead. Yeah. So, and then if you had the commando groove, if you were working there, so let's just take us again back to, we talked a lot about the Skeena. If we were to go to say the, uh, Maurice, well, I mean, I mean, some of those are pretty wide too, or, or like t- yeah. take us to a smaller river and what line setup, how that would be different than what you'd fish on the Skeena. So if I was going to, like, say I'll just fish the Kalem or something like that, if I was going to fish the Kalem, if it was the fall, I would fish a commando groove for sure because the water's usually quite pushy. It's got a big lake above it. So once the water comes up, it stays in shape longer, but it once it comes up from the lake, it, it pushes pretty hard. Um, think of a channel um, that's like a, doesn't go anywhere, so it's an old river channel. So, you know, as the water comes up, it just comes up and pushes into the bank a bit. So you're fishing high banks sometimes on both sides of the river because it's 
it's an old channel, bigger rocks, bigger structure. Um, so that's when, you know, it might be a bit fast on the surface, the fish are there, but because there's enough rock structure, you have to kind of get down through that upper column of water and have that slow swing. And, and, you know, when you, when you're fishing that groove, it definitely slows the swing down quite a, quite a bit. Right. So once you fish it with like, say just with a standard head swings through, seems a bit speedy, you throw the groove on, it cuts down right away. So at the start of your swing, and then it just, there's a lot more chub in the line just to hold everything back and it just kind of just barely it yeah it's one of those swings that you're feeling like oh this feels this i should get a grab any second because it's like wow it, it brings you to attention right away you look at it and it's like ah it looks a little fast water's high conditions aren't perfect you throw it out there oh it's a bit fast you try to go deeper uh, like a heavier head on a floater and it's like ah it's still not that great and you throw the groove on and it's like oh oh dude this is pretty nice then you start your brain starts thinking of oh wow there's a lot of spots i can fish high bank might be a bit fast but the inside edge is really nice but you just can't fish that inside edge of a high bank sometimes even though that's where the fish are because the fish it pulls through too quick right and by the time you're waiting you have such a long dangle your fly's not moving so if you're fishing that inside edge of a high bank you're casting into maybe faster water than you usually fish but because it's down and cuts through that column, it's swinging on in the money shot water, just you know three, four feet off the bank. It's swinging at the right depth, right? So you're almost fishing a little bit of vertical technique with it, but you're not really fishing vertical. It's just it's something hard to explain unless you've really gone out there. It just slows the swing down. That's yeah. the easiest way to say it. And then you're also, like you said at the start, you're throwing on. You might throw on a T17 or T20, a short uh, length onto the, onto those. Yeah, especially if you're fishing Chinook, right? Because just think of the Chinook are the biggest, baddest buggers in the river, and they're gonna they're gonna sit in the heaviest of runs unless the water's really high and there's lots of color. Then they'll sit on the outsides. But a lot of times they're sitting in that heavy, the heavy chop, and they're sitting down low. It it just seems like it's really fast where they are. But underneath that water is again pretty nice, like straight flow water. But they're just gonna push into that head. So you have to get your fly down in that zone as quick as possible. So you have your fly in somewhat of the zone where the fish are right and especially if you're if you're like dinosaur hunting for big guys right you know like the biggest baddest ones are going to be there a lot of the jacks and smaller fish 10 12 pounders 14 pounders will be you could be, be in classic steelhead water by all means type six will get them and stuff like that but if you want to target the, the big dogs um that's that's where the that's where they're going to be they're sitting in the biggest plug style water you that's can it. get to right yeah that's it okay that may and then for steelhead what would be the heaviest uh you might use for a tip um probably like a commando groove 10 feet of t14 t14 right? yeah 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 10 yep. feet of t14 pretty much but t11 is pretty is common. like it's pretty money yeah, yeah yeah or the opst run which is like a type six very similar run. right 12 that's right yeah 12 yeah. feet of t6 12 feet of uh of type six gotcha okay cool well let's uh and I just want to note, uh, you, we've been talking a lot of Irmias. I remember Simon Gosworth was on quite a, a number. Of, I guess it's been a few years. I think he was talking about. You know, that might have been his big tip. Was you know intermediate. Intermediate is a good thing to th- be thinking about. And I think, obviously, yeah, you talked a lot about it, and we've talked a lot about it on here. It's a it's an important uh, line to have in your arsenal. So it's good we highlight that. Let, let's start off. I got this little segment just called the two twenty two, which is top two flies, top two tips, top two resources. Just kind of as we as we take this out of here. Um, what would be, so a couple, couple flies, do you, do you have any names you could throw out so, so, so we could take a look online or do you kind of have just your own stuff? Yeah, I got my own stuff. There, there's kind of a, there's like a blue balls intruder we call out and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a black and blue, um, pretty legit fly. It, you know, it's got, it's got all the stuff in it from jungle cock to, you know, saddle hackles and, and Rhea, a bit of polar bear and stuff, but it's super sparse, super movie. Uh, made of a hot, you know, usually a little, uh, um, I would say maybe a, depending on the fly, a little spun PB and seal fur mix at the front uh, in bright pink and stuff. So your egg sucking leash style thing, but just like a pimped out version of it. Um, that would be kind of my one. And then I, I fish a lot of peachy, pinky, kind of fady stuff in the springtime, really sparse. Um, I'd say very much, you know, BC spot prawn looking, but not, not like that. Just the overall color combination, the amount of wiggle with the variegated, you know, black and white, uh, um, Amherst pheasant on it and stuff like that. Right. So just that kind of stuff really seems to work well here. And then, you know, just sometimes guys are all on the big stuff and something, you know, you got to look what everyone's, you know, I, I say it is for one of the tricks is, or, you know, maybe one of the. Uh, other things to do is what everyone else is fishing. If you see a lot of guys fishing big stuff, like switch it up, fish something different, right? 
go small, right? Because if they see a lot of stuff one way, they go, go opposite day, right? We're yeah. Bizarro that's, world. That's it. No, that's a good, I like that. That's a good tip. So on, staying on those tips, would you have another tip you'd throw out there as far as um, helping somebody find a steelhead if they're up there? Yeah, for sure. So I, I would just, I would really look for like the water. The, again, this is busyness. Like if, you know, if you're coming up here right now as a Canadian, it's pretty desolate because we have no international guys and stuff like that. So this year was pretty cool, right? There was, there was a lot of, a lot of water, a lot of open spaces and stuff. But if it's busy and you go fish within the Balkley and stuff like that, maybe don't try to go to the, like the best run that you think is the best run, right? Go f- try to find B water, just little nuggets, little pockets, little spots where Guys, like if you're a guided angler, like as a, as a guide and I'm running a jet boat, I'm not going to, if I have two clients, I'm not going to go and fish those little spots. Right. So I'm going to go to the bigger runs where I can put my two, my two, my, my two sports out and they're going to fish that stuff and they're going to get a fish there. Cause it's going to hold fish, right? It's an end tributary. It's going to hold fish, but I don't want to fish that after, you know, three guys have been on it for an hour or something like that. Right. So you go fish the little B water between spots, the traveling lanes. And I think a lot of times those pay really good dividends, right? Yeah. That's right. And what are those traveling lanes? How would you find a little nugget? Do you just have to pretty much fish the water? I mean, how would you find that little, is there any way to read the water to kind of know where that yeah. little nugget might be? I would, I would say depending on how your mode of transport is. If, you, if you're walking, then obviously it's a little tougher to find those little nuggets. But if you're drifting, you're drifting along, all of a sudden your raft kind of slows down and it's like, oh, this feels pretty good. And you look at shore and like, oh, there's a depression, there's a big boulder. That might only be a 10 foot 20 foot long slot, but it's like, well, should I pull over? Well, no one else has fished it that day. Look on the beach, any tracks, pull over, usually try to pull above it or, or enough below that you don't, if there's one in there, you don't kick them out by rowing over top of them. Right. And then I like to pull my raft away from those spots because if someone sees me there, like sometimes those are savior spots, right? You just walk up, fish that quick. Sometimes that could be a game changer and a, a day saver, right? Just those little spots. Right. And if you, if you can get a, you know, you get two or three of those little spots in a day, you might have two or three fish, right? That's a, that's a great, a great thing. And you might not even fish even, we all love to fish the big classic, you know, take a cast, take a step swings beautifully. Like, you know, you feel ripped off. You don't get a grab. Right. But a lot of water comes out of those little jiggles, those little short jiggles that are like painful. There's multiple currents. There's only a short seam, right? It's a short cast. And like this, like the eye of a run or something. A lot of guys miss the eye of the runs too. Right. So traveling fish love the eyes, right? They're moving to the next run. So those are little couple nuggets that you, that you got to look at at a river and just like, if no one fishes them, that's definitely a spot they got to move through. And if they could, if, it's got, if they slow down there, it's an opportunity to, to get a fly in their face and usually pretty aggressive. Their spots. I can always say, be ready for a first cast in there. Yeah. yeah. Cool. And just quickly, uh, as far as resources, do you have a couple of resources? If somebody wanted want to dig more into steelhead fishing, the Skeena, any of that, that you would direct them? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, my website, you can check me out, uh, triple W upstream adventures.com. Um, uh, Bob Hooten has some really good books out there. Um, um, so he's got a couple of really nice books that are, you know, it's, yeah, it's, you know, our whole fisheries, I know the conservation thing is tough, but you know, without me saying it, I feel like, you know, we definitely, every, everyone takes a toll on our fishery and that, right. And, and us as catch and release fishers, um, that definitely, definitely, you know, it definitely takes a toll on stuff. So I think we all, one of my big things is just to be, just treat each one very preciously, right. It's a rare, a rare diamond to get one on the fly. And, uh, when you get one, you know, keep them in the water, try to have a buddy fishing with sometimes doesn't have, it's always nice to have someone land it with a super soft net. Right. And you keep that fish in the water. If you need to snap a pick of it, just make it super quick. Um, and, uh, you know, and release it as good as, as you caught it and stuff. Right. So everyone's precious. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I just had a little note here. I, you mentioned, I think we talked, uh, Yossi, uh, he's another, we, we talked a little bit about OPST today. I'm just curious, who was Yossi, he was, can you just describe just quickly, was he like a founding partner of OPST in that crew? Yeah, I think him, James, and Ed kind of were together on it gotcha. um, uh, with that. And, you know, he, he's a funny character, um, a Japanese gentleman from Japan. So I fished with him for probably the last like eight or nine years. And that, and, uh, he comes over and he's super Jones and for steelhead right now. I just talked yeah. to him the other day. <laughs> oh, cool. He can't, he, he's stuck in Japan. And so he, he's, uh, All right. he's, uh, pulling his hair out. Um, definitely. So yeah, but you know, he's a great guy, super enthusiastic about it. And, and I think, uh, definitely, uh, um, sometimes it causes a bit of pain with, with, with everything because he's very enthusiastic. Right. And, uh, about steelheading, it's definitely, uh, um, a lifestyle choice for him. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. 
All right, Todd. Well, this has been fun. I, um, you know, I mean, obviously steelhead fishing, we've talked a ton on here and you can't dig into everything, but I really love that we dug into some of the gear again, especially with the OPST stuff because they have some, you know, some unique shorter stuff going on. But um, yeah, man, any, any you want to give a shout out in the next six months or so, anything new coming for you or your, your business or anything? Yeah, hell yeah. I just, I'd like to just, hopefully we get through this and uh, I can see, you know, family and guests again, right? That'd be the biggest thing. And just, just, just get through it. And, uh, and, uh, you know, we're always, we're always trying to push the envelope here and, uh, you know, just get out there. And if you have a chance to, to go swing, get out of the house, right? doesn't matter. Like high water, low water. You never know. You're always surprised. I'm always surprised. I learned something every day out there, right? So just, just, just keep, keep on keeping on. All right, Todd. Well, thanks again. Uh, upstreamadventures.com if anybody wants to connect with you. Yeah, until we see you on the next one, uh, thanks again. Thanks, Dave. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes with all the links we covered, just go to wetflyswing.com slash 188. If you can, head over to wetflyswing.com slash giveaway to join the next amazing giveaway to one of our amazing trips coming up. I want to take another minute here just to briefly run down with you um, a little bit on one of our sponsors to start with. And I'm just going to go to the website. I'm just going to go to, I'm going to go to actually wetflyswing.com slash anglers, anglers, and that'll that'll redirect over to anglers cup okay so i'm just going to go through this really quick and i might even do a video later on this but it's pretty cool so you open it up and the first thing you see right now is a guy holding a rod steelhead rod or uh maybe no maybe it's just a trout rod anglers coffee it says fuel for out here fuel for out here so basically yeah i mean it's it's uh all their coffee bags have a different fly pattern on them I've uh, been using the Muddler blend, which on the site right now is $16.50. Um, as I keep scrolling down, coffee by anglers for anglers. Subscribe. So they have a sub uh, subscription program, which is cool. They got this blue, this old school blue looking truck, which is, which is pretty awesome. And as I keep scrolling, um, just some different options. There's some shows you where it's made. Um... And I know the guys that I've been talking to, they've been doing this for quite a while. So this is like one of their passions. It's kind of similar to like the Wet Fly Swing podcast, Roy, where, uh, you know, we all want to dig in and support the community and, and build something great. So that's exactly what they're doing. So I'm going to click on, there's a little subscriptions and gifts link. Um, just quickly check that out. And let's see, gifts for uh, coffee for you. Or there's a gift link. And so I'm just going to go, if I was going to do the muddler, I can just click, oh, it says select options. So here you go. So whole bean drip. I'm going to go um, probably, I'll probably go drip. Subscribe and save. So delivery one week. Now, how often do I get it? Oh, so yeah, you can just basically sign it up. So. So sixteen fifty, and the cool thing about this is that um, if you sign up now, there you get actually twenty two percent off. So what is that roughly twenty percent? Let's just do that exactly. So sixteen fifty, sixteen point five times point two two equals three sixty three. So that's not a bad deal. So sixteen point five minus three point six three. So for twelve eighty seven. You get a bag of coffee, and this is good coffee. I, I actually, I've been drinking it, and it's probably, like I said, some of the best stuff I've had. So a five-pound bag is $75. I'm not sure if that's a better deal. I'm, I'm just guessing it is than buying the single 12-ounce bags. So again, so that you could get um, like $15. So you could get that for 60 bucks. For Let's just do this really quick. How many ounces? I think there's... 16 ounces in a pound so let's go 16 times 5 equals so that's like 80 divided by 12 yeah so that's actually 6.6 .6 bags so roughly so that's that's the way to do it so you could get 
6.6, so almost seven bags, which would be seven of those bags typically. Okay, so I'm just running by these numbers. So that's probably the way to do it. You buy it as a big bulk. Um, it's either that or you just do it weekly, which you can do here anyways. I'm, I'm kind of rolling through. I'm going to go back. I mentioned the blog. I want to see what they I'm, I don't think they have a whole lot on the blog because it's a fairly new site. Yeah, so they don't have anything there. Let's say they do have... Oh, right, right. So they got the Soul River. That's another thing. Chad Brown and the Soul River stuff. They're sponsoring what he has going, which is cool. Um, so, yeah, I just want to do a quick rundown on anglers. I might do this again for our other sponsors just to, to let you know. And if I do have a video, I might add that as well. I think that would be cool to add is, is a video to kind of show you, to walk you through some of this stuff. But right now, you got audio. I'm not sure how long this has taken, but um, so um, so yeah, I just want to do that uh, really quick. So I'll uh, wrap it up out of here and uh, just thank you for listening in. Uh, if you like this or if you uh, clicked and uh, purchased that, I would love to hear from you. Uh, you can send me an email, just dave at wetflyswing.com. And uh, let me know, you know, again, we're trying to support uh, these good companies that are supporting us. And I would love to hear from you. But uh, if you can, just click through and, and take a look for yourself. I want to thank you again for stopping by today to check out the show. I'm looking forward to catching up with you soon. I hope to maybe see you online or on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.